Okay, welcome to the second of a ser of the series of computing lectures. There are five of these in total, and in case you're not who so sure who the hell I am, um, I'm Gary Newport, and I teach ICT and computing here. And I have, just in case I haven't made it clear, 15 years of experience within the IT industry. So, worth being aware of. I don't know why, but it is. What we want to cover tonight are the following topics. So, we're having a look at languages. We're starting off from the binary point of view, um, going through hexadecimal down to assembler, and then start looking at third generation languages and fourth generation languages. We're going to start off with binary. That was cool. All oh, right, it wasn't. Um, what I wanted to first of all discuss is why we have binary computers. Because quite a lot of the time we perceive binary computers as because we've got modern day computers with their chips in and everything else. And actually, the reason why we have binary computers dates back much further than that. You may be aware that computing in the 1800s, a computer was a human being who undertook mathematical calculations. And what people wanted to do was design machines that could automate these normal routines that we're undertaking. So what they did was they used any components that they had available, and one of the key components behind that is the relay. This is a simple relay here, and this is the relay diagram. The relay is made up of a coil and a switch. When the coil receives a current, the switch closes. When the switch closes, a light can light up, and that becomes a 1. When the current is withdrawn, it becomes a 0. Very simple mechanical way of operating. Please be aware, aware that this is termed an NO relay. NO relay for normally open. There are other ones called normally closed or NC relays. But for figurative purposes, we have this in place. So all we have to do here is supply a voltage to the back and the switch will close, allowing current, allowing ourselves to signify a 1. It's a simple switch. It's exactly the same as your light switch that flicks on and off, but we're using electrical current to help ourselves to perform the mechanism. And obviously, therefore, it can happen much faster. The only thing with it is that it's mechanical. Therefore, anything mechanical is actually much slower than the electricity required. So the alternative is something called a thermionic valve, or simply, luckily, a valve. You may have looked downstairs and seen one of these before. Using purely electricity, well, valves come in many different types, uh, but you can use them for switching. They, because they use electricity, they are much, much faster than relays. The only thing with them is, as you can see, hopefully you can see that, they look a little bit like a light bulb. And they are light bulbs of, of a form. When they were first being manufactured, in fact, it was light bulb manufacturers who made them because they had the tools and the equipment and the know-how. But they were incredibly unreliable. That's why we use relays. It wasn't until coming up to the war, and a gentleman called Tommy Flowers, who worked for the post office and was a graduate engineer, devised a way of making relays more, sorry, uh, valves more reliable. From his exploration, from his work, we were able to make these so they ran all the time. Those of you that went to Bletchley may remember them saying that what they found was if they left them switched on, they didn't withdraw the current to them. A triode valve, which is the one that we use as a switch, actually still has three parts to it. It has the two parts that allow the electricity to flow, and the third part, just like the relay, allows the other two to allow the electricity to flow. So it's exactly the same circuit, but purely electrical. During the Second World War, we used these to process data, and those of you that went to Bletchley might recognize the Colossus. And that's the product of Flowers' work. Once we get past the war, we start to find transistors are appearing. Transistors come in many shapes and sizes. The one thing about them is this is the circuit diagram and gives you an idea. If you have a look at all of these, 
they have three legs, including the one which is the baseline, which is this one here. This one here allows the electricity, if there's electricity applied there, electricity is allowed to travel through the transistor. If you withdraw the electricity there, no electricity can flow. Exactly the same as the valve and exactly the same as the relay. One thing the transistor allowed us to do was to reduce the size. As you saw with the Colossus, it's a huge machine, generating huge amounts of heat. These allowed you to reduce the circuits much smaller, make them much, much smaller. And by the 1950s and 60s, computers were getting smaller. And then they devised a way of combining all of those transistors onto one small silicon surface. And this became our integrated circuits, our ICs or our chips. These are two examples of chips, and that is a shot inside a basic picture. You will also see one downstairs on the posters downstairs. All that exists on here are silicon relays, silicon transistors. They are still the same switches, and that's why we have binary computers today. Because all we're doing is following the same thing we've had before, which is a history of switches switching on and off circuits. This is our modern age. Because we can sync them onto one chip and we can make them smaller and smaller and smaller, we can get them to do far more in a small area. In 2011, it was announced that a 3.9 billion transistor IC was made. That's a huge number. Just to give you an idea, adding. That is using the transistors. We've seen those. There's two transistors there. These are resistors. These are two inputs, and that's the output. All that is is a NAND gate. As we saw last week about NAND gates, they are ANDs inverted, and that is simply a NAND gate using two transistors. So when we talk about NAND gates and we talk about logic, all we're talking about is a series of transistors in all these logical cases. Why is that useful? Well, because we saw last time that we could use a NAND gate to do a number of circuits, but there is a full adder. Okay, that's not a, a type of snake that's eaten too much. And not that type of full adder. By the way, anyone who's listening to that, there is an audience out there. Um, that's a full adder. What does it do? It will add the input of three signals. It's not absolutely clear, but actually this is adding the number of systems. So we have this being added on each time along here. It is simply adding up the totals. It's summing up the totals, shall I say. Okay. Now I said to you we're looking at languages and therefore you must be assuming at some point we've got to get to the language. So let's have a look at the language side. When Flowers came up with the Colossus, when people were designing the first computers, we had to talk to them in this switching language that they had developed. We had to talk directly to the computer and we did so through ticker tape. We did so through punch cards. All these were was they used light to pass through the holes. If light could pass through the hole, it was a one. If it couldn't pass through the hole because it was filled in, such as points around here, that was a zero. It was an on switch or off switch. That allowed current to flow or current not to flow. And therefore, the switch would operate or not operate, depending upon what it is. Exactly the same things being done here. It's the same system. We're talking to our computers in binary. Another way of doing it was the plug board. Simply allowing ele uh, electrical current to be applied to a hole, allowed electrical flow, which allowed a switch or a relay or a valve or something to operate at that point. At this point in time, we are talking to computers in their own language. So why bother? Well, I'd like you to have a look at the zeros and ones on that screen. Now imagine that you're writing a program. That, by the way, is a very small segment of Microsoft Word 2010. Now imagine that you've got one one or one zero just a little bit off. 
it's not easy to fault find. If we have a look at the previous one, if you have punched a hole in the punch card incorrectly and you've got two or three hundred of these, it's going to be a nightmare to find out where you went wrong. Talking to the computer is all well and good, but actually there's got to be a better way. The main thing to remember is that no matter what we look at, at the end of the day, that's your computer talking. Your computer knows nothing else at all. Okay. The drive, therefore, is not to get our computers to talk a different language, it's to get us to talk a different language to the computers, for us to be able to develop a new language. And what they were able to do was they were able to identify a new way of talking. They came up with a language called hexadecimal. Why? Well, let's have a look at the binary digits. Those are the binary digits from 0 to 9. Those are the 10 unique deanery values. Deanery is the counting numbers you're used to. We have 10 unique numbers, 0 to 9. If I stop running my counting system, if I stop using my binary at that point, there are a whole series of combinations I'm dropping from here. And the one thing you've got to remember, and if you went to Bletchley you may well remember, the one problem we had at this time was components were expensive. The Colossus was huge. To allow yourself to miss off all these bits, which happened to be a total of six more patterns allowed, that was a huge waste of resources. What we needed was a counting system, a methodology to address those, and it added us from 0 to 15. We couldn't use 0 to 15 because that doesn't make any sense to start your numbering system from 15, then the 16, and the next series will be 31. There's no natural pattern to that. So what I came up with was hexadecimal. Hexadecimal still has the same 10 unique numbers, 0 to 9, but we replace the last six with the letters A to F. Notice, by the way, that hex is called base 16 because there are 16 unique values, including zero. The highest value is F, which is 15. It's the same with our numbering system, deanery. The highest unique value is nine because we have zero. There are 10 unique values but 9 is the highest value, and that's true with all numbering systems. Once you're told the base value, you know that the actual highest unique value is always 1 below. Okay. Converting. How do I convert binary to hexadecimal? Well, actually, it can be done in three easy steps. Step 1, create 4-bit groups. Sorry, create 4-bit groups. That's not for, no, anyway, we'll have a look at it. There's a binary number. The first thing you want to do is you want to start counting from the least significant bit. This is always the least, it's the one on the right-hand side. LSB is a uh, common term for it. The least significant bit heading towards the most significant bit. And you want to have the number of bits divisible by four. If it cannot be divided by four, let us say that that last zero wasn't, sorry, that last one wasn't there, then you'd simply make the most significant bit a zero until you have got it divisible by four. You can then split it into two groups of four. Remember, if this happened to be three numbers when I separated it, I'd simply stick a zero on the end. If there was only two numbers, I'd stick two on the end and so on. It's just replacing the zeros. Exactly the same as if I told you I wanted you to make 10 a four-digit number, you'd put 0, 0, 1, 0. Once we've got this split into our four-bit groups, we need to convert it to deanery. Now, hopefully you remember, and we treat each one uniquely, that the first column is valued 1, and the second and the third are always multiples of 2 from there. So, this one is 4 plus 1. This one over here is 8. Sorry, I better finish that one off. 4 plus 1 is 5, in case you were confused. That one is 8 plus 4 plus 1, or 13. So it's a simple case of adding the number of 1s and their position on the, uh, in the binary system. 
The third and final step is simply convert them to hexadecimal. And all you have to do is if you don't remember the table, refer back to the table we had before. You'll recognize that 5D happens to ex be exactly 5 in base 16. 13 in, in deanery happens to be D in base 16. That means that the number we started with, sorry, just to finish those off, that means the number we started with actually becomes D5. Once we've actually got to that far, once we've spotted that, we can condense eight digits to two. We've made it a fraction of the size it was before. We've also introduced new symbols, which means that we've got greater breadth, so that when we come to look at this code, we get something like that. That's again another segment of Microsoft Word. This is the binary code on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, you can see the hexadecimal that makes up that program. It's still a jumble of letters and numbers, but it's certainly clearer for us to see these than it is those. For example, you may notice quite quickly that there's a row of zeros there. It may not have jumped to you to see that those are all zeros there. Coding in hexadecimal is easier for us, the humans. The computer is still using this. This is easier for us. It's also faster for us. There's less digits to type. I've only got to type two sets of digits. So, each computer is made up of these switches. Each computer is running binary, but each computer we can use that binary and convert it into hexadecimal. The thing is, is that different commands run different chips, sorry, different um, series of switches. And as you saw, we had an adding circuit there. It's up to the chip manufacturer where that adding circuit is on the chip, on the processor. If they put it to somewhere different to everyone else, then it's going to have a different address, a different way of calling it. And that's exactly what's happened. These are types of processors over the last 30, 40 years. Each one uses binary. Each one has a whole load of um, switches inside of it. Each one performs basically the same task, but the way of telling it to do that task is completely different depending upon each one. I'm going to give you an example. Inside of every chip is something called the accumulator. You've probably come across that in class. The accumulator is like the work desk, the, the surface upon, I've got to be careful here, but the surface upon which you work. I had to be careful there because of a video that terrifies my students. Um, but the idea is, is this is the workspace of your processor. It's one piece of memory that everything is worked in. That's where your processor puts everything, and it, has to, it works in that area. So let's have a look at two types of processors, the, the Z80 and the 6502. Both of these came around about the same time. Both of them are 8-bit processors. Both of them have a similar instruction sets. Now let's say that I want to load the accumulator with a number. In the Z80, that's the binary code I need to tell it to load the accumulator. Notice the difference of the 6502. Exactly the same operation, exactly the same series of switches and everything else, but it's a completely different value. If I turn that into hex, I can even spot even more so how different they are. So if I want to tell the Z80 processor that I want it to load the accumulator with a number, I have to give it the value 3A. I have to send it the value 3A. But if I want to program the 6502 to load the accumulator, I have to give it the value A9. I have to know that as a programmer. I have to know, with all of those processes before, the exact hexadecimal command required to execute that command. There's the full instruction. 
load the accumulator with this number. Load the accumulator with this number. The number is exactly the same in both cases. 3A0F or A90F. Load the accumulator with 15. Both doing the same operation and yet a different set of instructions. By the way, this is the kind of number which you may have had the zero missing out of, and to make it eight bits, you stick a zero on the end, in case that was confusing anyone. So not forgetting that your computer's still talking binary, we're learning hexadecimal. And in the first few days of doing so, this is how you as a student would have been asked to learn how to program a computer. This is called an Emma, and the idea is that this extension board has the hexadecimal keys down here. We're actually quite fortunate in that we have an Emma 2, a, a much more modern version, as you can see. It's a darker green. That's an Emma 2. This is called a training board. Just up here is a 6502 processor. This is the central processing unit for this computer. You would program the hexadecimal using these keys here and use these to issue the commands. As you enter the commands in here, let's say A9, it would light up there and go into the next location of memory. You would enter it through here, you'd see the commands coming up here, but the computer would immediately take that as binary signal and store it in memory. That's how you learn to program first off. So, if you wish to want to program the 6502, you'd have to learn the instruction set for the 6502. Just an example. This is the small instruction set leaflet that comes with the 6502. This is one of the several booklets. This is the instruction set you have to learn. We'll have a look at that in a bit more detail in a second. Uh, you have to get to understand these commands. This is the x86. That's the processor that runs the PC. This is a Z80 chip. These two look very similar, came out around about the same time, completely different instruction sets. And as I say, if you wanted the program for these, you had to learn all, all the languages. So what they came out with was they said, well, I'll tell you what, we've got these commands, LDA, load the accumulator. And what they did was they wrote these into a book. So for the Emma 2, I can pick up the manual and I can look in here and I will find LDA. And I'm giving a whole series of choices, but I can see one of the choices in immediate mode is A9. LDA A9. Immediate, except they can't spell immediate. Actually, yeah, they, no, they can't. Um, but this is what you will get. And so you would know to type in, and you would write down on the instruction sheet, so you'd have a sheet of paper which you would write down LDA because it told you something. And I'd write these down, but I would code this in, into the Emma 2. And it didn't take people very long to say, hold on, why can't we now write a program that allows you to use a full set keyboard, and rather than typing A9 in, you type in this lot. All we need then is a small program that will take the LDA and convert it into the A9 for you. Simple. And so we got programming mnemonics. That is a small section of the instruction set for the Z6502. Uh, and that's what programming looked like in the 6502. That's actually a Windows-based system. You can do it now if you wish to. Not right now, clearly. <laughs> but you can go home and you could learn to program in these languages. It was turned into emulator. Please note, this program is in error. That's not the screen I would have seen. I would have seen something very similar to the old DOS screen that you see when you program v uh, Visual Basic in the command line. Nothing fancy as this. 
These kind of programs came along because of further developments. Okay, one key term you need to know about assembler. As I say, there's the instruction set for the 6502. To use the mnemonics, we call it an assembler. So it's an assembler language. And the important thing to remember with the assembler language is that whatever the mnemonic I use, it has an exact match for that processor. LDA will work, will convert on a 6502 to A9 every single time. And A9 will always be that binary number on every computer. STA, store the accumulator in memory. In the 6502, has the value 85. It will always be 85 in the 6502. By the way, I'm, I'm saying always, if you ever come to look at these sheets, you'll look for STA, you'll see it down here, you'll see 85, you'll also see 95, 8D, 9D. That's because of the condition in which you wish to use the command. So if you ever get into assembler, it's not quite as straightforward. But what I want you to recognize is that when I have chosen the one command on here, it will always be that number. And one command becomes one code. That's it, always. That's adding. Add with carry. That's the only add command the 6502 had. And it was always going to be in immediate mode 69. Immediate mo mode means do it now. So, assembler language has a one-to-one -one mapping to the binary value, to the hexadecimal, to the binary. There is no difference. The nice thing about assembler language is that actually, as long as I start to learn the mnemonics, LDA was the same command used for the Z80 as it was for the 6502. So I could now program the Z80 and the 6502 at, with the same code. I didn't have to worry about the actual coding this side. I didn't have to worry about the numbers. All I had to worry about was using the language of the processor. And this was a huge leap forward. An absolutely massive leap forward. But it started a new revolution. If we can talk to the computer in this way, it doesn't take someone very long to say, well, if I can convert mnemonics, then surely I could do the same thing with the English language. So what they tried to do was go for something called natural language programming. To a certain degree, that's disappeared. But, in fact, we've moved away from natural language, uh, uh, language uh, systems, but we do use language much closer. Let's have a look at an example. Outputting to a monitor. If I want to output something to the monitor, that's what I have to enter in binary. This again, and by the way, I'm dealing with always with the 6502. You might get the idea that I like the 6502. I did. It's a cool processor. Um, but that's a 6502. The nice thing is that I could then go through and I could map that exactly. So the 8 bits there relate to the 8 bits there and so on and so forth. It is exactly mapped. Mnemonics, exactly mapped. LDA is A9. STA, in this case, is 8D. LDA, again, A5. This is a different mode of LDA. Remember I said there's all these columns. But it is always going to map because I've used it. If you notice, LDA, in this case, has got hash FF. That tells the uh, assembler I want to use immediate mode. I'm using a number. Load the accumulator with this number. This one doesn't have a hash. That tells the computer that I'm not using immediate mode, that I'm using one of the memory registers. In fact, this means load the accumulator with the value and memory location 20. But the assembler knows that, and it knows the code, and it will never be anything else. If you count it, 8 bits here, each 8 bit will be a pair here, and each one of these lines has a line there. It's an exact one-to-one -one mapping. That's it in the next language up. Who wants to go back to binary? Print 16.
So it was. Actually, it's not. I just realised. Oh god, see, it's not quite true. Anyway, it doesn't matter. When we get to high level languages, we can then condense this down to this. And this is where you get your new generation of languages. We'll talk about generations in a moment. The thing is, the way these work are different. There are no one-to-one -one mapping. Each person's interpretation of print may be different. So everyone went off and wrote their own ways of turning these long, complex routines such as print to screen and came up with their own ways of doing it, what they thought was faster or more reliable. I'll give you an example that C, um, C++ focused on making code fast. So the coders who wrote the compilers and the interpreters for C++ went out of their way to make sure their code was fast, as fast as possible. Sometimes it would fall over. Sometimes it would go wrong. But it wasn't that often. And it wasn't a bad consequence of it. The main thing was to make it fast. Another language which I have uh, mentioned in my group before is one called ADA, A-D-A. This is an American military system. It's used for firing missiles at the enemy. Doesn't matter how rarely it goes wrong, you really don't want it going wrong. You don't want to be firing a missile at your, the enemy and it coming back on you. So ADA would code print a completely different way. It would make sure it was safe, solid, reliable. ADA is a slow language, but reliable. C++ is a fast language, but unreliable. BASIC was written as a developmental language for people to utilise. That's why it kind of sits in the middle of the two. So what I now need is I don't need an assembler because I can't just do one-to-one -one mapping. I've got to decide how I'm going to do this. And basically I come up with one more method is the compiler. The compiler allows the programmer to write the code. Once I have written the code, I then send that to a small program that compiles it into machine code, basically into binary. That then produces either an exe or a .com file. And the user can have that file and they can take it away and they can run that file. The compiler writes the code, I'm oh, sorry, I write the code. The compiler converts it into the binary system that we are aware the computer talks in. And I can then hand it off to the user who then uses that file. They don't ever need to see the written code, ever. All they need is the exe. I'm going to give you an example of this. Print 16 becomes that. So the compiler would take my instruction. It might convert it to my original code. And I end up with an executable file at the end. What are the advantages? Well, as I say, it can be distributed. It's fast. It's faster than the interpreter because the code is simply converted and then all I'm doing whenever I run the file is it's running the binary exactly as it is. I don't need to learn assembler. I don't need to worry about assembler language and I certainly don't need to worry about machine code. I'm now far away from the process, I'm miles away. Don't need to worry about this, this lot at all. I cannot worry, I don't have to worry about how to address the ports on the computer or know anything specific. I only have to write the command print and I know it will appear on the screen no matter what computer I'm running. The compiler will convert my code to suit the computer I am on. So if I'm coding using Visual Basic on a Mac, it is the compiler's job to make it suit the Mac processor against the compiler that will be written to work for the PC. I only have to write programs. I don't have to worry about the computer. Coding errors can be detected. The compiler will detect when you've spelt something incorrectly. But there are problems with it. If you've made some logical error, it's not going to pick that up at all. Um, and it's not possible to then go and find where the errors do occur because it's now converting to binary and it's got no relationship to your original program at all. 
Okay, let's have a look at interpreters. Interpreters work in a completely different way. Interpreters will take the code. So when I've written the code and I run an interpreter, it actually compiles each line at a time without remembering what it did to the previous line. So if I run an interpreter, so I write my code, I run the interpreter, it takes my first line of code, it converts it into binary, it then executes that line of code, and then it goes right back to the beginning and fetches the next command. And it converts it, executes it, converts it, executes it. For example, print 16. Converts it into that, executes it, goes around to print 13, converts that, executes it. Interpreters have a number of reasons why we want to use them. I'm running through it and it will trap compiler errors as we're going through, but it will also catch runtime errors. So when I get to a certain stage where there's a logical error, there's a good chance that it's going to throw it up. I can watch values. I can watch what is happening to my variables as it is unfolding. I can't do that in the compiler, it's not possible. But I can watch the var variables step by step using things called breakpoints. Again, it's not processor specific and I still don't need to learn assembler. So that's a good thing. But it is incredibly slow compared to the compiler. I can't simply give my code to the user and say, there you go. I've actually got to make sure they've got the interpreter. Years back, we used to have to hand out Visual Basic runtime code. So if we ever handed Visual Basic out, they had to have the runtime code as well to execute the file, to run it, because it actually had to interpret it for us. And that meant you were giving the user your code so they could change it, edit it, play around with it. The compiler stops that. They can't edit it because there's nothing to edit. There's no code. It's purely binary and hex. So let's have a look at these. Here's a simple program. The compiler will take that, compile it to binary. The user will run that code. And they'll keep running that code. Now this code is very simple. All it does is it starts x at 0 and it loops until x is equal to 3. How many of you noticed a deliberate error? Yeah, x minus 1. x will never equal 3. But the compiler will never pick that up. The user will because that's a perpetual loop. That's an infinite loop. It will always go round and round because x will never be equal to 3. So that will go through and through and keep going through that and making an error. And they're going to come back and say, hold on, your code doesn't work. And now I've got to go back and find it. That code there should have been x plus. I then change it. I then have to recompile it and then redistribute it. A bit like sending FIFA 2013 out again because the ball's not appearing. How does an interpreter work? Well, an interpreter works in a completely different fashion. The first thing it does is it takes the first line and interprets that code. It then executes that code. It then goes back and takes the next line and interprets that and keeps going round and notice how it's going through each line, executing, interpreting it, executing it, then taking the next line down and doing the same. When we get to here and we got to the end of the loop, it interprets the end of the loop, it goes to execute the code, then it goes back to the beginning and it repeats exactly the same process. It still needs to interpret and then execute the code. Even though it has already done it before, it does it again and again, and this will happen three times in all. Hopefully from that you can see why an interpreter is much slower, because for every line of code, it's having to interpret it as well as execute it. Your compiler just executes the code. Okay, language generations. I've talked about generations, I've mentioned them, but I want you to be aware of them. 1GL, first generation language, is called binary. 
This is the language of the computer. If we move one step away from that, then we've got hexadecimal and assembler. We're talking to our processor, but one step away from our processor. Assembler is allowing us to use pseudo-English, LDA, or load. You will see that quite frequently. Load, store, add. Third generation languages are the compilers and interpreters, and these are Visual Basic, C Sharp, Java, Python, all of these languages are the ones that we're looking at. And you'll notice I've mentioned the fourth generation language, which is SQL and HTML. That's as far as you need to go with generation of languages at A level. But you need to be aware of these different languages and what's available. You need to be aware that there is a first generation and so on. So what's this fourth generation lark? Well, third generation language is called um, imperative language. It's a language that is actually telling the computer how to do something. Fourth generation languages don't tell us how to do something, it just tells us what we want it to do. We want you to do it, but we're not going to tell you how that's up to something else. Let me give you a clue, or an indicator, or an answer. I don't mind which one. You can choose. On the left-hand side is the imperatives. Console read line. It knows to read a line from the keyboard. That's what we're telling it we want it to do. X equals X plus 3 is imperative. A whole sequence of commands in the third generation language. 3GL are imperative languages. All three third generation languages are imperative. They tell the computer how to perform a task. On the right hand side are declarative languages. There's an example of a SQL command. This one is saying select everything from, and there will be a table name there. So select all the data from a database table. It doesn't tell it how to. It's just telling it I want you to go and get the data. I don't care how you do it. This one is HTML. It's saying, I want you to stick a picture there, please. It doesn't tell it how to stick the picture there. It doesn't have to, because underneath a declarative language is an imperative language doing all the donkey work. This is coasting. This is kind of nice, you know, select everything from the table. The declarative language has got a kind of cushy number running here. Because when you issue this command, the declarative language then calls an imperative language command and says, right, you do all the work. The imperative language goes off, it knows how to get the data, it busily gets it, collects it, passes it back to the declarative, that then cleverly goes to you, there it is. I've done all the work. It is important that you understand that declarative languages lie on top of imperative languages. That no matter how you slice it up, a declarative language has underneath it an imperative language running and doing all of the work, all the how to do something. Something I was asked recently is, when do we use these languages? Do we ever use these languages? Does anyone ever still a code in assembler? Uh, a few years back, I'd have gone, oh yeah, definitely. But actually, we've moved into an area now where people have learned so much about assembler and they've learned so much about making code tight that we've got compilers that can condense code down far better than most of us could do if we were working in assembler. So when you get C sharp, C sharp will crush the program down to the fastest possible module it thinks it can achieve. So most people will use a third generation to start off with. Let's start off with a fourth generation language. You know what fourth generation languages are generally used for, certainly from HTML point of view. You know this is building websites. Querying databases, you probably are aware that behind Google sits a huge database. And when you type in the box and you say, I want to find this, please, and you click on search, all it's doing is it's going off and interrogating a database. What you may not be aware is sitting behind that is a declarative command, similar to that select command. You press search in Google and it goes off and it runs a declarative statement. Behind that declarative statement is an imperative set of instructions that tells you how to do it. 
Website designers work in fourth generation languages. Database programmers work in, work in fourth generation languages. These are entire industries based upon fourth generation languages. They may very rarely touch third generation. Not true with database. They will touch third generation quite a lot. Third generation languages, well, basically most software you've ever come near has been written in third generation language. I've given some examples there. Microsoft Word, your web browser, the thing that actually does all the donkey work and you just go, yeah, whatever. Internet Explorer, ooh, it's rubbish. Yeah, you go and write it. Because it's a donkey work. It is the hard work of it all. Oh, it's taking your HTML, which you think is so clever, and it's having to turn that into actual command your processor can understand. It is an interpreter. Your browser is an interpreter for HTML. And you're all going, come on, move faster. This poor thing is hammering away, trying to take all this HTML and convert it to your processor. Your processor's probably busy doing something else. He's going, oh, you can hold on. Your browser's going, but I need to run this quickly. And you're screaming at it going, you're useless. It's cruel. Notice games appears twice. People do use Assembler. Lots of people use Assembler. But in all of those cases, it is unlikely that the base code was ever written in Assembler. There are very few instances where you will write Assembler raw. You are most likely to start with a third generation language such as C Sharp. What gaming programmers will do is they will write their game in C Sharp and wherever it slows down, wherever there's a time issue, wherever there's a glitch running, they will then go and learn, uh, go and do the assembler language. As a gaming program, if you want to get into gaming, you have to know assembler because you then have to tweak your game to make it faster. You have to get everything you can out of memory. You have to suck this machine so it really works hard. You use these things when there are no other alternatives. If speed is the issue, you worry about using assembler. If timing is an issue, there are security systems out there that are time critical to the nanosecond, to the microsecond. Now you imagine that you're just about to, let's say it's a James Bond movie and the bomb's going to go off and it's time to the millisecond for the security and James Bond as he normally does leaves it to the last fifth of a second and he goes no problems Miss Moneypenny, punches in the code but what he doesn't know is sitting behind it is a window system that suddenly decides he's going to check the clock's all right. As he presses the last button it goes nope sorry timing was out, bang. Doesn't look so clever now. Security systems are likely to run on assembler because they've got to talk directly to the hardware. If there is no third generation language, you'll learn to program in assembler. You have to talk to this processor to get it working. That's generally, that's rarer and rarer nowadays, but it's not unheard of. You may have noticed viruses. Viruses will try, most programmers will run C, uh, C sharp, but write the virus in assembler, adjust it, so that, because it's got to run on your hardware. It's got to get behind your operating system. It wants to get behind your antivirus software. Your antivirus software sits inside your operating system. So all your virus wants to do is get behind it. And to do so, it needs assembler so that it can interrupt your operating system. So while your operating system is lugging itself around like some huge elephant, trying to desperately go, oh, I think I'll check the date now, I think I'll check the clock now, it can interrupt it and go, no, I'll tell you what, let's delete everything. Device drivers are generally written in C sharp. But if you again, timing is of an issue. And that's the important thing to remember with assembler. It is about speed. It is about lack of memory. It is about there isn't something existing. You don't write assembler just because it looks cool, because it's difficult. And no one, I cannot find a single situation where anyone programs in binary anymore. And that kind of seems obvious. Who's going to sit down and do all those zeros and ones? But actually, it's only 50 years ago. That's all you programmed in. We have covered from the 1940s up to the modern time. Up until the 1960s, we were using binary. These have come along in the last 40 odd years. 
we are now running very happily with third generation languages and we've got a, a plethora of them out there all doing different things. One of the new ones you may see me mention is one called Python which is really beginning to catch ground and it looks like very much like BBC Basic that disappeared in the 1980s, 1990s. Fourth generations all over the place. Most people think that it's the third generation languages, this is where the jobs are and everything else. In fact, more databases exist out there than anything else. I was going to do a Bugs Bunny tune there, but I'm not going to. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. I Hopefully that's been useful. Uh, hopefully I'll see you next week.